All right. Welcome to the September 6th subcommittee meeting for the equity subcommittee of the cannabis advisory committee. Let's go ahead and call the roll. Okay, we'll do, but before we begin, we begin, I'd like to make a note about today's meeting format. The Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act exemptions expired in July of this year. So our cannabis advisory committee meetings and subcommittee meetings will now be conducted in a hybrid format. This means that we will be able to welcome attendees both in person here at DCC headquarters in Rancho Cordova and virtually over WebEx. So this week is our first set of hybrid meetings and the DCC team has worked very hard to ensure a seamless transition into this new format. The most important part of these meetings is public input. So if we run into any technical glitches today, please know that we're working behind the scenes to work them out. You will be heard and just keep raising your hand. So with that, I will call the roll and please answer present when your name is called. Dr. Brown. Present. Uh, Sarah Payne Pearson. Absent. Christine De La Rosa. Present. And Chair Shockley. Present. Wonderful. A stab quorum is established. All right, thank you for joining us for this meeting of the equity subcommittee. At this time, I'd like to invite members of the public to provide comments on agenda item number 2 uh, items that are not on the agenda. Uh, moderator, will you please open the floor for public comment for items that are not on the agenda. Yes, we're now taking uh, a comment on agenda and agenda item number 2. The topic for this public comment period is displayed on the slide, so please keep comments at this time limited to this agenda item. If you would like to make a comment, please raise your hand by clicking on the hand icon next to your name if you've logged into the meeting or by pressing star three if you've called into the meeting. For our in-person comment commenters, please raise your hand and our audience moderator will work with you. All commenters will have two minutes to speak with a 30 second warning and each member of the public will have one opportunity to speak on each agenda item today. So, yes, we have an in person. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, thank you. Since I have some things, I'm going to go quick. I'm going to light of John Sawyer's successful request of a joint legislative audit committee to look into cannabis licensing practices at the local level, highlighting in the early times that corruption is widespread in California's weed industry. Now the state is taking action. I'm Cesar Casamayor, social equity applicant in Fresno. I agree with Assembly. Jim Patterson's comment in the LA Times about the need to include Fresno in the audit. For the past five years, we have actively engaged in Fresno's cannabis licensing process and have the documentation of foul play. Local Assemblyman Jim Patterson has asked Fresno to be included, citing in the misconduct here in the state's fifth most popular city. Under Kirkland is a good word for it, but what Patterson characterizes as a misconduct is regarded by those involved as a business as usual in Fresno, leveraging personal, professional, and political relationships, a bipartisan array of individuals from government, business, and non governmental organizations. Have been recruiting and paid to advise businesses applying for standard and social equity licenses. Some have even already ownership shares. Fresno Unified School District Trustee Elizabeth Johan says has lent her name to applicants and bought in City Council District Haven District 3 and the Artist Tree District 2. She is the spouse of City Council Member in District 5, Luis Chavez, and a possible candidate is camped for a seat in 2024. Now, the time County Development Corporation, CJD Edgar of Fresno, is only of economic, oh, excuse me, Development 7, Economic Opportunities Commission, CEO of Vegas has ownership shares in Element 7. Eagle also shares the California Transportation Commission. Jerry Dyer's campaign finance manager, Ted Vesso, CEO of Central Valley Group, has lobbied on behalf of at least eight cannabis companies during the application process. We've experienced and worked within the scope of our city's policy and practices. They do not ensure fairness, nor do they prevent conflict of interest, predatory practices, or favoritism, lack of transparency, inconsistency, and double standards that have been hung up in the licensing process here. Lastly, prompted by Assembly Joe Sawyer's positive action on May 10th, 2023, we submitted the following reports to the Fresno B that I will share with you all. We've asked the reporter to dig into the story of the hard news because we have a public shared information with them that they feel to report it first. Have now been put in the first degree. To step in and conduct the full order of first degree cannabis policy and roll out the regulation. The policy fixes must come from Sacramento. In the city of the Cannabis Control, the Joint Legislative Committee, Attorney General Rob Bob, thank you. It's our office. Thank you for your consideration.
Okay, Rachel Carmen Cesar, I've just sent you a request to end. Very, very bad uh, from the main. I can hear you fine, but the when people comment, like Mr. Wyatt, you can't hear it very well. Carmen, raise your hand again. One more time, Carmen. Okay, I've sent you a request to unmute. You can't hear me? Can you hear now, me? Can. Now you can. I, I was just saying that I can hear you fine, but it's very warbly when Mr. Wyatt was talking. I just want to make sure we're able to hear everyone okay. It sounds like the reception is not very good or the IT equipment. Okay, thank you. All right, are there any other public comments on items not on the agenda today? All right, Chair Chocolate, would you like me to close agenda item number two? Yes, please. All right, thank you. It's closed. All right, our next item on the agenda is a presentation from the DCC's Equity and Inclusion Division. Eugene Hillsman, uh, Deputy Director of Equity and Inclusion. Uh, thank you for joining us today. The floor is yours, Eugene. For sure. All right, so uh, good afternoon. I'm happy to be here and provide a little bit of a description of some of the information that should hopefully be beneficial for today's conversation. Um, and so I wanted to share a little bit about some of the primary government entities involved in supporting equity programs across the state. Next slide. So here you can see a number of state entities, right? So the Department of Cannabis Control, the Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development, local jurisdictions who have a role in implementing programs uh, in cities and counties, and then the legislature. So the DCC, um, regulates cannabis licensure in the state of California. There were three agencies that were the result of uh, consolidation, previously three licensing and regulatory programs. Uh, those state agencies were formed together with the goal of streamlining and simplifying access to licensing and regulatory oversight of commercial cannabis activity. However, key elements of existing structures and processes regarding cannabis equity continue to be administered by other state agencies. I'll talk a little bit more about the DCC's role with regard to equity in, uh, in the presentation, but wanted to start here to help uh, really lay the foundation for some of the department's work uh, overall. So I'll start with, with GoBiz. So the Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development uh, provides financial resources to local jurisdictions. Primarily, that comes through the Cannabis Equity Grant Program. So far, 19 jurisdictions have received money from GoBiz to implement equity programs and distribute money. Of those funds, 80% of those uh, resources have to be in the form of grants uh, and or loans. There's also the opportunity to provide technical assistance, of which there's a 10% cap, and there's the ability to spend some of those funds on administration of those programs. In addition, they also administer the California Community Reinvestment Grants Program. These are grants in local communities to support uh, nonprofits that have been negatively impacted by the criminalization of cannabis, including support for job placement, mental health treatment, substance use disorder treatment, system navigation services, legal services to address barriers to reentry, and linkages to medical care. A number of individuals are familiar with local jurisdictions um, who are primarily responsible for implementing equity programs. These local jurisdictions usually use funds provided by the governor's office of business and economic development, but they can add additional resources uh, to support equity uh, programs in their local jurisdictions as well. Um, and the idea is really to support individuals who've been negatively impacted by the war on drugs uh, and offer assistance, including priority licensing and additional resources to really enter the cannabis industry as entrepreneurs. 
And then the last box here is the legislature, um, who's really responsible for allocating resources, passing laws, and helping set additional priorities. They're also a stakeholder in developing regulations. Next slide. Um, so I also wanted to acknowledge that there are other entities that are not represented on this slide, right? So we have district attorneys who are responsible for providing information with regard to um, previous criminal justice uh, convictions to allow for expungement and businesses may be eligible for tax credits through the Franchise Tax Board and vendor compensation through the California Department of Tax and Fee Administration. So here you can see there are a number of entities across the state who have a role in supporting cannabis equity. Uh, and it's really the idea uh, and, and kind of responsibility, I believe, of the DCC to help share that information to make sure that people really understand how these pieces fit together. So that's one of the things that I wanted to do here today. All right, so here you can see um, this is some additional information of uh, with regard to the information previously described. So in thinking about the Department of Cannabis Control's uh, role, really, you know, in thinking about the focus of licensing, compliance, enforcement are really core functions of the department. And one of the things that we want to do is really think about how equity fits into all of those pieces, right? And so with regard specifically to, to equity, the Department of Cannabis Control provides technical assistance with regard to licensing. So if you have uh, an issue with receiving your state license, we have additional resources that can help you kind of get to the finish line. We manage equity fee relief. So that includes both fee waivers and fee deferrals and also highlight promising practices. We also are developing additional resources, including video content to share information, right? So interviews with business owners. Um, and like the details that have been presented today, we really want to think about how we can share this information in an accessible way to make sure that individuals understand how these pieces fit together. Next slide. So here, um, and this is especially designed to kind of provide some additional context with regard to definitions, which I know we're going to get into later in today's meeting, is to give you a sense of spaces in which there might be flexibility in kind of creating additional opportunities to refine what's in the regulations, and then also outlining um, kind of what things might need to require additional legislative action, right? So. Here you can see an example of fee relief, and there are certain requirements that are included in statute, right? So in the legislation that dictate how funds are going to be distributed um, and really tell the Department of Cannabis Control how to implement the law. And then there are other places in which the Department of Cannabis Control has flexibility in refining regulations uh, kind of based on the information that we receive. So here is an example of that. Um, where you can see arrest and conviction, the percentage of ownership, the 60% income requirement, uh, the amount of money that's reserved for locally verified applicants, that information is included in statute. So in thinking about opportunities to uh, kind of address how that information um, is created and how um, kind of those terms are dictated, uh, there's no flexibility there, right? That if we wanted to change those things, that would require additional legislative action. But an example of a way in which uh, kind of that was refined through rulemaking includes the neighborhood residency requirement and gross receipts, right? So that was an opportunity in which uh, if people are familiar with this process. Um, it was refined to include census tracts, that more specifically, uh, kind of unemployment and education data. And then there were other options to create opportunities for individuals who have been directly impacted close family members as a way of determining eligibility for fee relief. So that was a space in which the Department of Cannabis Control, as a part of its uh, flexibility, had the ability to really refine rulemaking moving forward. And so that's one of the things that I wanted to mention in thinking about definitions, right? Some of this language is included in the state. Um, some will require legislative action, and then some of that information can be refined through further rulemaking. Next slide. So one of the things that I wanted uh, to do today is give you a sense of some of the things that the Department of Cannabis Control is working on, uh, as well as the Equity and Inclusion Division. And so as a part of our work, we partner with the Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development uh, through local jurisdiction meetings, right? The idea here is to really 
create a space in which local jurisdictions can hear about what's happening at the state level, um, and in particular to share information between themselves and also allow uh, for communities that are coming online who are interested in uh, developing equity programs to not necessarily feel like they have to recreate the wheel. So creating a space in which those conversations can take place um, and create opportunities that, that don't start from scratch. Um, I also think that the relationship between uh, kind of the, the two agencies is really important given uh, kind of the roles that we occupy and where we're able to kind of share information between uh, kind of state agencies is really important and I think will continue to be important moving forward. As I mentioned, GoBiz administers both the Cannabis Equity Grant Program and the California Community Reinvestment Grant Program. Um, our work with the Office of the Small Business Advocate is, is just beginning, but that's another state agency um, who is working to support businesses. Um, and, you know, there's some issues with regard to federal limitations, but we want to be creative and thinking about opportunities to really leverage existing uh, support that's happening in the state and direct more of those resources to cannabis businesses. So uh, I think that's an example of how we're trying to explore a relationship and figure out where there are existing resources to really leverage that support to support cannabis business owners. Uh, content development, which is the number two uh, on this list. The idea is, is really to think about the development review of information and how that information is being shared so it's accessible. Um, this includes the equity resources page on the Department of Cannabis Control's website, the forms for applying for fee relief, uh, guidance documents that outline uh, the process for accessing resources, um, video content, and you know, some of the, the information that I've described at the beginning of this presentation to try to make sure that that content lives in a way that it's evergreen and accessible for people who might not be able to attend a subcommittee meeting so that there continues to be a way to access this information to figure out kind of how uh, kind of these connections are being made with regard to state equity. Local jurisdiction, I mentioned um, promising practices previously that work involves working with local regulators um, we're also in the process of thinking about um, how we might continue to provide technical assistance to local jurisdictions. Um, we have promising practices on our website. We've been working with LA County as they come online, really just in a series of regular conversations to make sure that they're aware of kind of what's happening in the state. Um, so that's more targeted in conversations with uh, local jurisdictions. We've also provided specific content um, around ideas such as um, kind of direct grants. We're working on a project around shared manufacturing. So just wanted to note for local jurisdictions who are interested in learning more about kind of specifically what things uh, are happening across the state with regard to equity initiatives, the Department of Cannabis Control can also be a resource in really tailoring some of that content to your local circumstances and providing information that should be helpful with regard to implementation. Um, grant administration, so separate and distinct from GoBiz, the Department of Cannabis Control also manages uh, a number of grant programs. And so really thinking about um, how those funds and equity can be incentivized in that process is something uh, that's also important to the Department of Cannabis Control and continues to move forward with um, kind of all of the grant programs that the DCC administers and thinking about reviewing proposals, meeting uh, about grant progress, reading reports, et cetera, et cetera. So that'll continue to be a focus for both the Department of Cannabis Control and the Equity and Inclusion Division specifically. And then I mentioned uh, some of the work that we're doing around technical assistance to figure out how we can better provide support to local jurisdictions that are involved in the implementation process. Next slide. So here, uh, I just wanted to provide a description of some of the things that we're working on in Q4 of this year, calendar year uh, 2023. So continuing to really think about how information can be shared effectively. So as a part of that work, and I've had a number of conversations with stakeholders about you know, what additional resources might be really helpful um, in kind of thinking about how we might be able to share uh, kind of what's working, but um, and specifically, you know, wanted to talk a little bit about a, a project with regard to predatory practices. So really um, kind of giving us the ability to capture and make known um, kind of practices that do not really have the, the interests of equity business owners kind of at heart and making sure that that has visibility. Um, so we'll kind of serve a number of functions 
but one as people are really interested in kind of exploring the space in in cannabis business ownership that there will be a place that they can point to uh, to see kind of what things that they should kind of understand about kind of entering into deals and to to kind of have some legitimacy associated with the department of cannabis control and sharing that information so that's something that we're hoping to roll out in phase one in q4 of this year Another is uh, kind of some video content. So we're in the process of taping some additional content and really trying to link together information that can be shared with uh, various stakeholders who are involved in the equity space. Um, so not always is it very easy to understand um, kind of what resources might be available. And so thinking about ways to really tailor that content um, from the perspective of who's interested in accessing it, right? So if you're an individual, if you're a business owner, if you're a local jurisdiction and, and using that as a primary way to kind of access resources instead of kind of state agencies in which people might not have a full understanding of how those things fit together. And so really organizing information and sharing it in a way that's accessible and making sure people are really armed with the information that they need to move forward. Um, I talked a little bit about some of the options that we're, we're developing for local jurisdictions. Um, some of that content will be in the form of starter kits, right? So for jurisdictions that are coming online, specifically those who are uh, either in the kind of assessment phase or for retail access grant recipients who are really in the process of thinking about how to develop uh, cannabis equity programs, we want to make sure that we're really arming them with information as moving forward. So putting together a series of resources that can be shared consistently uh, and over time that allows people to understand that they don't necessarily have to reinvent the wheel. Um, I mentioned some of the tailored content that we're uh, planning on developing and moving forward to provide additional resources to local jurisdictions who might have interest and really figuring out how we can develop a hybrid approach in which we can kind of mix and match some of those resources depending on the needs of local jurisdictions. We're also planning on creating some additional venues for stakeholder engagement. Um, so you have two things that are listed here. One is office hours in some ways, um, kind of subcommittee meetings can be restricted based on the time limits. And so wanted to create additional spaces in which people might have more flexibility to share information or receive updates from the Department of Cannabis Control. So that's something that we're also um, kind of interested in rolling out in Q4 of this year. And then also some information with regard um, to kind of specific content that might be included in a form like a newsletter, right? And so that's also something that we're interested in sharing just to kind of capture recent developments to make sure that people understand kind of what's happening in the state from an equity perspective. And then the last thing is continuing to work on kind of data, right? And thinking about data in integration specifically. Um, hopeful that kind of in, in Q1, Q2 of 2024, uh, phase one of kind of the data integration uh, kind of is in place, which really kind of thinks about making sure we're able to kind of capture uh, equity information along with kind of what businesses are verified at the local level and the state level, and then also to be able to share that information with stakeholders. So that's really kind of the first version of some of the things that we're thinking about with regard to data, understanding that there were a lot more requests from the subcommittee about kind of requirements. Um, but in thinking about phase one, uh, we're really hopeful and excited to kind of do that in early 2024. So. I'll stop there and see if, if there are any additional questions from, uh, from the panel or subcommittee uh, and uh, take questions from uh, the audience as well. Thank you, Deputy Director Hillsman. Uh, are there any questions from the members? That was a lot, Eugene. Thank you so much. Very robust. It's exciting to hear about, um, you know, all of the plans that you have to engage the local jurisdictions. And I really liked the attitude about not starting from scratch, because there's a lot of best practices out here that jurisdictions can share. And I would like to see DCC kind of be the, um, you know, just the repository of all of that, and then to uh, share that with the local jurisdictions. So there is some consistency, especially in terms of starter kits for local jurisdictions just coming online and they don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, I took some notes here uh, in terms of, um, talking about technical assistance for local jurisdictions. Um, what do you mean by that uh, in terms of helping them with their technical programs, those who have it, and then um, giving more resources in terms of dollars or just sharing 
programming. I'm not clear about what that looks like. Yeah, for sure. So I think one of the things that um, in trying to design ways to support local jurisdictions as they're doing equity program implementation, I think uh, starts with the understanding that jurisdictions are in various places right across the state of California, right? So very, very large state. Um, in some instances, we have jurisdictions who have a lot of experience in engaging in this work and have uh, kind of a lot to offer and thinking about um, kind of what um, kind of things could, should be learned from. But from the DCC's perspective, I think we want to have a flexible approach and really meet jurisdictions where they are, right? So if it is a situation in which a jurisdiction says, hey, we would like to meet with the Department of Cannabis Control every six weeks for a year, right? As we're kind of coming online, we have specific concerns about uh, kind of how we might develop um, kind of our permitting system. How do we prioritize licenses uh, for equity business owners? We're thinking about um, kind of our stakeholder engagement process. Are there things that you've learned um, that are important to do early in the process while you're in the middle of the process, while you're later in the process? And if jurisdictions are saying, yes, with that level of frequency, we'd like to engage with the Department of Cannabis Control, we want to offer that as an option, right? Mm -hmm. um, but there have been other examples in which jurisdictions have more of an acute problem that they're trying to address, right? So, for example, it might be a situation in which um, a direct grant program is, is beginning to roll out and say, hey, we're going to do this in the next couple of weeks. Can you kind of offer additional support? We also want to be positioned well enough to provide some targeted kind of information, which kind of looks out across the state, maybe comes together with like four or five different jurisdictions who've done this work and to be able to deliver that, you know, within 48 hours of the request to make sure that jurisdictions kind of have access to the best information available. So I don't think that there's necessarily um, kind of one approach that we want to take with regard to technical assistance. We want to be really flexible. Um, especially because um, it also requires the participation of local jurisdictions who have different needs, right? Like not everybody is terribly excited about Eugene coming to speak with them. Um, but for folks who are, we want to say, hey, we're, we're willing to kind of work with you um, and do that. The only thing that I, I can anticipate of, of kind of your remarks that will probably not be available are additional resources, right? Which, yeah, for sure. Um, and so not really in a position to do that, but in kind of thinking about sharing information, knowledge, um, and being really thoughtful about how we can do that in a way that best meets the needs of jurisdictions we want to try that. Okay. Appreciate that. I have one other um, yeah. item. When you're talking about the California Community Reinvestment, and I know GoBez is the, they fund that. Mm -hmm. I'm not real clear about what that looks like either. Um, how much money is dedicated to that, to that initiative and what kind of reinvestments are they uh, approving for that pot of money? Yeah, so so would not be able to kind of speak on behalf of of GoBiz, but but what I know is um, every year they publish the list of recipients across the state of California who've received that support. There's certain categories of nonprofits that are eligible to receive that, right? So some of the criteria. Um, that determines eligibility has also been described, right? And thinking about um, kind of unemployment rates, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I would not be best positioned to kind of describe that information to you, but um, certainly we can point you to some resources if you want to. Yeah. Website, and I do see that they just announced a group mm -hmm. of uh, recipients. But I'm wondering, in terms of just community reinvestment, I mean, how how effective is are those dollars in terms of you know, I'm looking at, you know, a cohort group of people who were disproportionately impacted by the war on drugs, right? And I would like to see that community reinvestment money go back into, you know, those folks and not just, you know, discard other people who, of course, have issues with criminal justice or unemployment and, you know, education, all of that needs to be addressed. But specifically, this community reinvestment money that comes from cannabis tax dollars, right? to actually go towards that community. Um, is there any effort to focus in or set aside some of that community reinvestment money to, you know, be able to reinvest it back into, you know, the entrepreneurial community and folks who were disproportionately impacted by, you know, disparate cannabis rules and, 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 and laws? 
Yeah, I mean, so I would not be able to kind of, um, I understand the question um, and kind of the spirit of the question about kind of how resources are tailored, but I, I do think that uh, rep would be better able to answer your question. Sure. Eugene, uh, you talked about technical assistance and uh, uh, to piggyback on Dr. B's comments about uh, how that works with the state uh, to local jurisdictions. Are, is there going to be technical assistance that the DCC creates for individual applicants and businesses? And, and what, what does that look like? Uh, because different jurisdictions have different levels of technical assistance. Uh, the, the content of that technical assistance may be different depending on what the rules and regulations are for a different municipality. Um, but, you know, I think there's some overall, you know, just assistance that all applicants probably need and maybe their local jurisdiction provides it or maybe they don't. Uh, is there something that DCC is doing to fill those gaps or provide some sort of umbrella um, technical assistance for applicants across the state? Yeah, so I mean, so I think that, you know, one of the things that is is challenging um, kind of about the dual licensing structure is one of the things that you, you mentioned, right? That the, the local circumstances sometimes vary specifically um, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And so the requirements are different. And so some of the challenges that business owners face um, might be consistent and in some ways there they might be varied. So I think, you know, one of the ideas really around some of those equity documents that I mentioned, like predatory practices are things that could be accessible for every business owner, right? So um, here is something that uh, every business owner might benefit from and whether that's like these are things to um, kind of be aware of when negotiating your deal with your landlord, right? So that's something that kind of transcends uh, kind of a specific local circumstance or, um, you know, you want to be aware of these ideas when you're uh, kind of engaging with um, kind of business partners, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's the space in which we can kind of do some of that work to kind of fill those gaps, right? Common issues that business owners are going to face regardless of, of where they want to enter the industry. And I think another thing that we're interested in doing, um, and this is this is something that the Department of Cannabis Control already does, is provide technical assistance with uh, receiving your state license, right? So if there are additional questions, challenges that business owners are facing, as a part of the state process, those resources already exist, um, and business owners can email equity at cannabis.ca.gov to get some additional support. Cool. Um, there's one area in particular that you mentioned, uh, which is applicants dealing with investors, for mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. and and what information can we disseminate to applicants that they should be aware of so that they're prepared for those engagements, and you know. The, the the challenge is you have to be low income to be social equity, yeah. but you often need a, a tremendous amount of capital to take advantage of that equity status and, and start a business. And uh, what I haven't seen a lot of jurisdictions do well is provide the information on how to bridge that gap as an entrepreneur uh, through education about uh, startup financing. Right. And so there are best practices that have been developed over over decades, uh, you know, by many entrepreneurs on how they've raised funding, uh, you know, starting with no money and leveraging other people's money. Uh, and, and so I would just uh, suggest that the DCC really focus on um, education around startup financing and and looking at uh, why Combinator in, in particular. Uh, the Silicon Valley uh, startup incubator, uh, which has really been the hub for developing these best practices. Uh, all the information is there, but it just needs to be uh, disseminated to applicants. And that's one of the things that I would definitely agree with you is that all of the technical assistance is awesome, but the technical assistance that startup companies need, and especially people of color, formerly incarcerated folks are, that, are, that qualify for equity is literally about capital. Like Y Combinator really talks about tech and that's awesome. But what types of investors are there? You have impact investors, you have private equity investors, you have venture capital investors, you have one-on-one -on -one investors, you have angel investors, and all of those different types of capital 
come with their own risk and reward. So one of the things, like even before we talk about like how do you raise money, it's like where do you want to raise money? From whom are you looking for? Are you looking for a values aligned investor? Then you probably need to go to the impact investor communities. You probably don't need to go to the debt equity communities. You probably don't need to go to the VC or PE capital communities because you're looking for somebody that's not expecting you to do a 10 X return in three years. Impact investors have patient capital. So I have found for our own company that impact investors are way better than any cannabis investor currently in the market. And then you have to tell them, how do they figure out what type of cannabis investor? If you look at an investor who started invested in 2016, and you look at their portfolio and you should ask them, who have you invested in cannabis? Because if they invested in like a canopy growth, they've lost all their money. So now they're looking to you to make up that money and the money you're trying to make up. You're paying for somebody else's fault, right? So you want to see when you're talking, how do you vet an investor? Like that's a big thing for technical assistance. Ask for their portfolio, ask who they've invested in, look at who they invested in and look at how those investments did you'll get a better, clear understanding about how that investor is going to be engaged with you. So for me, when I'm talking to, you know, equity applicants or equity founders, I'm like, if you have somebody that is only got $250,000, but this is the first time they invested in cannabis, that's a great investor for you because you're going to be able to teach them what their expectations should be. Because we now have as a state and also as an industry, five years of regulation for recreational because back in the day i know you remember it they were all like we're going to make 17 billion dollars on one dispensary right that that was what was being said out there and millions of dollars were poured in to very large companies that now are worth 11 cents so you want to teach the equity folks not just that they need to raise capital but who are they looking for who are their targets how can they get in those communities there's entire communities of impact investors entire communities of angel investors and now with what happened on Thursday with rescheduling to three, we have been, I know, I know, you know, in an investment desert for like 18 months, right? Everything kind of shut down in 2022, even for the big guys, right? They had went to debt financing, but HHS just came through. And if we get to schedule three, you're going to see a lot more investors that are super excited to invest in something that's not federally a schedule one. So now there's a whole other group of people that have kind of been waiting and sort of watching and sort of like been like, I don't know, I think maybe they're going to be like, oh, schedule three, we're doing research, we're doing testing, we're on a pathway to descheduling. I have $50,000. And one of the things I always like to tell equity and equity founders is that sometimes you raise all the capital you need, you need from investors that have fifty to $100,000. And what is really cool about that is that we have learned that people of color communities sometimes have that. Like they own their own businesses, they might have a couple of free, they have extra money that they would like to invest and some of them want to invest in cannabis. So that type of education I think is invaluable to the founders. Yes, you have to raise capital, but how do you decide who to raise it from and where to raise it from and why you should raise it from them? Let them know that if you raise from PE or VC, more than likely they're going to replace you as a, as a, as a, as a founder. Because most PE and VC, that's their thing, they get it. And then they replace you with one of the people that they like. Or if you go into debt, is that the right thing for you? Because normally, if you can't pay your debt, they take your license. That's your collateral. And they might not be able to take it today because there's legislation that says you can't sell it for five years. But that's their collateral. So if you don't, you need to be vetting them, make sure that they want you to succeed, not that they just want the license. This is the education that I think is foundational before anybody starts to raise capital. And I, 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 I would I would I think that's all that is is very important, uh, but I think even more foundational is just understanding like the difference between debt and equity, and the difference uh, just understanding like how to come up with the valuation to begin with, right? Because you're right, you know, like I started out by raising small amounts of capital. My first investment was forty thousand. My second was ten thousand. You know, the, the one after that was 25, but I knew how to develop a valuation and then break down the percentage of the total company that I was willing to sell for what amount of money. And then also just knowing the different phases that a company gets different levels of investment at, right? Like, you know, you pro probably want to start out with friends and family or smaller investments to get your company to a certain stage. But yeah, but you need 
you need larger capital at another stage, right? And so then you you get into t- seeking venture capital or angel investors and stuff like that. But before you know who you need to get money from, you need to n- understand the mechanics of of how the money works when you're when you're asking for it. You know? Yeah. Right now, what we're doing is back in the day when we were raising capital, I guess in 2016, 2017, 2018, for me, you could say valuations were $10 million. You cannot get away with that now. Founders today cannot say, I have a dispensary license that's worth $6 million because anybody will just be like, not really. So what we're learning to do is having other types of things where you don't require a valuation. Like you can have a you know convertible note, no valuation and have a valuation happen afterwards. So these are all things that you're correct. We have to do that because the way we raised capital Five years ago does not fly in the market that we're in today. And the cool thing about it is, well, not the cool thing, but the thing that's important is that we're a commodity. So we can actually say to folks, like, I could give you a valuation that means absolutely nothing today. Or I can tell you this is what my plan is. Give us the money in three years, two years, one year. We'll evaluate how your money helped us get to the next place. And what happens for that? that then the investor becomes committed in helping you become successful rather than saying, oh, you told me your valuation was $6 million. And now you don't even have close to that, you know, per member unit per share price. So like, that's a failure. But if you're like, no, I'm going to use this money. Here's how the money's going to be used in the performa to advance us to this much. And at three years, we'll value how your money increased our valuation. So these are all things that we could teach. And I agree with you. That's something that we have to do from the ground floor. Yeah. But I always... I, the thing that hurt, hurts me a little bit when I've been in some of the technical, not necessarily with the state assistance, is the way that they're talking to the founders. It's like, you, if you just do this thing, you're going to get money. And we, we don't want to, I don't want to give them false hope. I'm going to be like, here's the, as you said, investment 101. But then here is how that's next step. This is what you need to do here to identify and vet your investors so that you understand what your business model is and the type of investor that fits the most with your business model. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I think, you know, given kind of the dynamism of, of capital markets and like the complications of debt financing and equity financing, it's unlikely that the Department of Cannabis Control would be able to kind of be experts in that space and provide access to those resources. But I, I think it might be an opportunity to point to places in which those resources already exist to make sure that people have they're access all, to that information. They're all over the place yeah. already. Yeah. Yeah. People just aren't directed to it right. to say, Look, you know, there's a, a number of different uh, financial instruments that you could use. There's, you got plenty of options. If you understand them, then you can evaluate which ones are going to be best for you at any given time, right? And, and so, just giving that direction to say, "Hey, why Combinator or any other institution that has this information, you know, broken down and readily available already," you know, just just having those resources ready to give to applicants as early in the process as possible. Well, this has been really exciting for, for me representing the city of LA and we're getting ready to go into another iteration of our technical assistance programming. So in terms of investment one-on-one, and we touched on that, but this is a lot more granular and I think a lot more apropos in terms of where the cannabis industry is now. To Ms. De La Rosa's point, it's not 2019, 2020, and the industry has changed. And I think we're, we're, we can be nimble enough to address that. Also understanding that, you know, the equity community is not monolithic, and there's so many different levels of, of expertise and technical support that they need. And so we're going to look at that in terms of just, you know, maybe a an investment um, 101 and then an advanced meet, intermediate and an advanced investment type of technical support. Um, depending on where you are in your journey and what you need in terms of uh, your businesses at this point in time. But I think it would be awesome if you could point in the direction of places that have already done that. I know that Y Combinator is really good for tech. It's a little bit shifted for cannabis because cannabis is a commodity and not tech. But there are other things that are commodity focused. People who are doing agriculture types of um, informational informational webinars around if you're a cultivator, Here's how you might raise capital, but not as a cultivator of cannabis, just as a cultivator, right? Because eventually our cultivators and cannabis will be treated like farmers, like people who build and grow the plant, which everything is related. Everything else is related to that, right? They've to me been the the least um, taken care of. 
in, in the situation, even though everything relies on that cultivator. Um, and so having just a resource portal that says, hey, you can go here to learn about how to raise capital, especially now with HHS, we might have agricultural subsidies getting opened up. How do we tell our cultivators to start preparing for those, right? Um, you could have the Y Combinator as a link. You could have, we have our own um, accelerator that we use based on Y Combinator, but for cannabis specific. And I'm sure there's plenty of others. And let people choose what is their kind of, what they need at the moment that they need it. I've got one more resource that would be good to point to. Uh, it's called Slide Bean. Uh, Slide Bean. Uh, one of the challenges that equity entrepreneurs face early on is developing a business plan to even pitch to investors. You know, many folks haven't gone through that process of, of writing it themselves, or it may be challenging for them to write it themselves. So we have to hire, you know, attorneys or CPAs to help with that oftentimes. Uh, but there's this resource called Slide Bean, uh, which is a lot less expensive than hiring a CPA or, or a attorney to do it, but gives you a guide on how to develop it yourself and also has a series of YouTube videos that that ex, that explains how to develop a deck and also the different types of financing uh, as well. So it's a lot of education as well as a service that you can pay less than fifteen hundred dollars for to develop a professional pitch deck. Uh, <laughs> Is the state able to recommend specific, let's say, platforms or, you know, like uh, Max it was talking about software kinds of products? Is the state allowed to do that? Because I know as a city, we cannot endorse individual types of businesses and platforms and things like that, of course, because of liability. So how does that work for the state? Yeah, I'm not sure, right? So this is a situation in which we're describing how we might develop those resources, but mm -hmm. all of that information would need to be vetted to make sure that we were yeah. able to do what you're describing to avoid some of the challenges that yeah. you mentioned. Yeah. But, but one of the things that we are thinking about is really utilizing the, that office hour space to facilitate some of those conversations, right? So that might be a place if people were aware of resources, right? It might not be like, okay, well, here's an endorsement of the Department of Cannabis Control, but have you heard of any ideas or spaces in which people can share information? And so instead of just kind of having uh, kind of a space in which people kind of are bringing issues broadly to that conversation, also really thinking about some topical conversations and financing might be one of them where those resources can be brought to the conversation and then shared. Yeah, I like that. Those being like 15 minute, 30 minute, uh, and who's gonna man that phone? Long, longer than that. Um, and so we've, we've recently hired a staff service manager one uh, who's gonna be responsible for helping spearhead that. So Robert, if you're listening. Um, <laughs> And so that's, you know, one of the things that we're really excited about Great. is kind of creating a more formal space for some of those conversations. I think that's one of the biggest things that I hear is that they feel like they can't get into the DCC to talk to somebody um, around technical assistance, I'm sure, mm -hmm. other things. So I think that's great that y'all are developing that right now in place. That's perfect. Absolutely. All right. Okay, so let's go to public comment on this discussion. If there any body who wants to make public comment, please uh, raise your hand. Actually, I'll go ahead and, um, and open this up. Um, we are now going to take public comment on agenda item number three. <clears throat> the topic is displayed on this slide, so please keep comments at this time limited to this agenda item. If you'd like to make a comment, please raise your hand by clicking the hand icon next to your name if you've logged onto the meeting or by pressing star three if you've called into the meeting. For our in-person commenters, please raise your hand and our audience moderator will work with you. If you would like to state your name, you can, but please do not feel obligated to do so. All commenters will have two minutes to speak with a 30 second warning and each member of the public will have one opportunity to speak on each agenda item. So with no further ado, Cheney Turner, I have just sent you a request to unmute. Good afternoon, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Cheney Turner. I'm the founder of Beyond Equity. I'm also a uh, chair of the Oakland Cannabis Commission. And uh, I wanted to uh, speak on the topic of, uh, of investments. Um, I believe that the DCC and uh, certain municipalities can do better in protecting our equity operators uh, from 
predatory uh, investors. Um, we have numerous uh, equity operators who went into incubation uh, agreements with um, uh, operators who are no longer in uh, operation due to uh, uh, exploitive agreements, um, high rent, also um, fraudulent agreements. Um, we have a history of people going throughout community asking for people to invest into cannabis businesses that don't exist. There's even someone on your uh, committee who has fraudulently took investments from people throughout California, including Oakland and Los Angeles, and to invest in dispensaries that don't exist. Where's the protection for these people? Um, where's the accountability? There needs to be more investigations, and there also needs to um, be a committee uh, or a board to, seconds. to hold people accountable for exploiting and stealing basically from um, marginalized communities that they claim to represent. This has been going on for way too long and operators and the communities that are supposed to be served are still without need and still without dispensaries and they're still without reinvestments or refunds for what they invested in. Thank you for Thank your you. time. And now we have an in-person commenter. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, I just have a question. I mean, uh, a comment in regards of back to the reinvestments. We continue to see that the way that GoBiz approaches funding grants or giving grants, if you're a grassroots organization, for example, and you don't have uh, like a million dollars in your account, a lot of these grants you don't qualify for. So there needs to be a change in language on who can apply for these grants and how they're given to community because we continue to allow for the big kind of uh, corporate style of nonprofits to be able to get the funds and have very little limited relationships with the most impacted communities in, in our cities or where we're we at. So I think there needs to be a, a, and we've been asking this for a while now, so it's not new. The way that the funds are available, such as with um, partnerships with um, uh, Sierra Health Foundation that has uh, Elevate Youth California that uses Prop 64 funding and then there's others. Um, I think the, the problem is that we continue to see the flaws and that is that grassroots organizations that don't have a million dollar or a $500,000 budget don't qualify for these grants. Thank you. Paul, I've just sent you a request to unmute. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much. Uh, this is Paul Hansberry, lovingly and legally. Um, I was just wondering, I know that there's, um, well, let's see. I realize that there's a big difference between, say, the uh, operators in the Emerald Triangle and operators in East LA, and that one size doesn't really fit all. But I'm wondering if there's a, a universal or at least an, a, a consistent definition uh, for eligibility, I know that with GoBiz, um, they're they are now looking at the different local jurisdictions, especially as it pertains to their geographic requirements. Um, whereas I do believe the DCC has has limited to um, entire zip codes based on a census, and I'm wondering if there's any um, plans to make the more consistent between the organizations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Reese, I've just sent you a request to unmute. Sir and founder of Posh Green Cannabis uh, Boutique in San Francisco, also uh, assisted with uh, the equity program in San Francisco, uh, getting farmed. Uh, so I, I think, uh, a lot of things that you guys said was great about having these classes um, uh, about mentoring on investment. That's a big part of everything that's going on and more 101. And I think like the people who wants to be incubated should be um, they these people. We should do more due diligence on them and what they're really about, um, because I've seen a lot of bad, bad actors and all of this coming out now that the years are are to come. Um, and I and I think like. Um, 
what you guys are saying about equity or people who knows about this stuff to to be able to give the technical support. Actually, me and my uh, partner, we we started a consulting company to be able to tell people about this stuff. Um, her name is Andrea, and and it's called Sloop and Posh because people need to know about this. I started both of my companies, and Eugene knows this with one money from one company to purchase the other one. You know, and no one showed me, but it's it's all about being able to say no when things are not right and finding the right partner and knowing what partnerships really are about and what can happen if it doesn't go. You know. If the practices are not done correctly in the contract, and um, and I and from hearing everything that you guys are saying today, uh, I think if we can really get those type of things impl implement uh, implemented, excuse me, um, it will seconds. it will work out great. It will work out great. Like LA said, there's different levels, and it should be different levels because everybody is not this, at the same level. Some people know how to get stuff done. Some people really need help at the bottom level with uh, just starting the, the formation of a business. So um, that with that being said, I uh, it was a lot of great points here and if we can get them done and we're here to help. And also, um, you know, we need more equity people that are just equity with no investors like myself. Thank you. Laura McCoy, I've just sent you a request to unmute. Laura McCoy. All right, we'll move on to Anthony Avalos and Laura, if you um, get back on, just raise your hand again. So Anthony Avalos. He's doing well. Um, I just wanted to say two things uh, as far as suggestions. Uh, moving forward uh, to kind of address some of these other comments that we're hearing uh, meeting after meeting. Um, first, I would like to see the production from DC from the DCC of a statewide review of equity programs, including cost analysis of licensure attainment through the first year of operations. I think the only way for we to, for us to understand completely how to help uh, produce successful equity businesses is to know intimately what the struggles are, what the largest obstacles are, and that can be done through that cost analysis and larger review of the equity programs. Secondly, I think that there needs to be the development of a DCC enforcement unit with cannabis lawyers and forensic accountants that are auditing equity programs, contracts, and management agreements. If we are just simply saying, here are a few things that you should try to stay away from, I don't think that the DCC is is going as far as it could potentially go um, to prevent predatory practices and to prevent those who um, may not understand what type of agreements they're getting into to uh, have access to um, evidence of um, malicious intent. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Laura McCoy, I just sent you a request to unmute. Oh, Yay, thanks, everyone. Um, I have a question about the loans that the county is making in Alameda County. So there was a group here who um, formed an equity group, and one of the members had already received a loan from the city of Oakland for cannabis. They did not repay it but they became part of the second group, which received a different amount. And I'm wondering, as the last person just says, how do we provide oversight so that those people that are doing things like that are identified and also um, um, weeded out so that people who do qualify for the um, equity funding is getting it who are truly getting it and this is not just a game for them where they know how to go and get the money is there some mechanism or some organization at this point whistleblower whatever that we equity candidates can utilize to make sure that those kinds of things don't continue to happen thank you thank you 
Alfred Torregano, I just sent you a request to unmute. Body, thank you to the panel. Uh, it's been a lot of good uh, dialogue today. Um, uh, my name is Alfred Torregano from Los Angeles, uh, owner of Space Flight uh, Retail Dispensary, also a board member of COA and CEPC. Uh, I just really want to say today that um, I would like to suggest and make a request that as we're looking at emerging markets, um, we know that there, if there was never an equity program that the market place and capitalism would never look back to those survivors of the failed war on drugs. And so as we look at opening new emerging markets, I think we should put in a mechanism that embeds social equity, regardless of these racial demographics, because as we know, not even 50% of the California state is legal, you know, have legal uh, markets. Uh, and so with that being said, as new markets emerge, you know, it's gonna be small license opportunities, but I think there should be a mechanism that keeps social equity inside of each and every cannabis program across the state of California, you know, for us to really see uh, some recompense and repair to the failed war on drugs. And so that's my only suggestion today. I appreciate you all. Thank you. Thank you. Elise, I've sent you a request to unmute. Timony, and I'm the folk, one of the co-founders of Sierra Kind, a uh, cannabis cultivation operation in Nevada County. My partner and I are two-time equity grant recipients, and we are small farmers. Um, I have I was born and raised in a small town, but have lived all over California. I want to just make it clear. It seems to me everything that I've read so far. There is a huge divide with equity between rural versus urban. And I somehow, I kind of feel like Alfred was on the right point of kind of keeping the equity grants, uh, you know, sort of looking at the characteristics of cannabis cultivation versus owning a dispensary or a uh, distribution operation, because those tend to be located in urban centers. The needs of rural folks are very different. Um, at one point, someone mentioned, oh, well, cultivation, y'all are just farmers. I belong to the Farm Bureau. I'm not allowed to be an official member. I can only be an associate. Um, because I live in a small town, I've reached out to the Chamber of Commerce. They won't deal with me because I'm a cannabis business operator. So I feel like there needs to be consideration taken into account for rural versus urban. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Madam Chair, Nina Parks, I've just sent you a request to unmute. I just resent the, the request. Hello, can you hear me? Can you yes. hear me? Hi, okay, awesome. I definitely need to change my, my title. I'm no longer the chair of the Cannabis Oversight Committee in San Francisco. Um, however, I'm still um, an equity operator trying to figure out how to navigate San Francisco um, and also partnered in equity dis distribution in Oakland uh, called Equity Trade Distro and uh, um, a board member of Supernova Women and a board member of the Equity Trade Network. So very glad that this meeting is happening. Um, as you can hear, you know, from many people, you know, because our equity programs were very focused in local, local jurisdictions in the beginning, and we set the tone for the rest of the United States to even have equity programs. Like five years later, six years later, we are in great need of like aggregate data collection from all of our programs to see what is effective and to see how the state of California can actually support overall equity for the state. Um, it just, again, it just so happened that we were tip of, tip of the spear and now we need um, some time for some reflection and reform to our program, um, as well as obviously our um, our financial distribution. And, uh, you know, I did a, um, a, a data collection survey of at least 14 of like the 44 folks that were participating in San Francisco's program. And a lot of those uh, operators said um, that they're actually in worse financial standing that they were when they started. 
Um, and so we really need to start to take that into account. If 30 seconds, if the goal of the equity program is to you know, financially boost people after being harmed by the war on drugs, we have to see what can economically work to actually put people in greater standing versus worse standing. We need data for that. So that is uh, my comment. Thank you. Thank you. Jay Johnson, I've just sent you a request to unmute. For having me today and thank you for your time. Um, I'm a local operator based out of Sacramento, have a retail license, came through the equity program that's local to Sacramento, which is called referred to as the core program. And no matter what phase you are on in along in your journey and becoming um, becoming available in the legal cannabis game, the biggest thing that anyone can do from a state or a local level is help with the taxes. I don't care if you're a distributor, if you're a manufacturer, if you're a cultivator, the taxes is the biggest thing harming this industry right now. It's the one that more people talk about. If you guys ever visit the CDTFA out here in Sacramento, since you guys are out here today, go down to the CDTFA when they have one of their cash payment days and talk to the license holders, what's affecting the most. It's always taxes. So speaking on equity today and for the equity into cannabis, the biggest hindrance is always gonna be the taxes whether it's your city taxes that are due every month, which is on a local level, but on the state level, dealing you know, from a retailer's aspect, dealing with the new excise tax that you guys have implemented every quarter, along with the sales and use tax every quarter, to give core qualified or equity qualified applicants tax relief for five years will be the biggest thing you can do, which won't you won't have to take out of your budget to give liquid capital to anyone, but it'll be a bigger boost than you guys can even imagine. And it'll allow people who actually wanna be involved in the industry to rise to the top. Because when you throw out cash, most people just see handouts. But if you say, hey, we're gonna give you tax relief for those of us who have owned a business, that's the biggest hindrance for us getting out of the red, as they say. So thank you for your time. And please think about tax relief for core and equity applicants in the future. Thank you. Thank you. And Marissa ETA, I've just sent your request to unmute. Now that GoBiz has forced local jurisdictions to change their qualifiers for um, the local equity grant, it there's definitely a, a big difference between urban and rural qualifications. And um, because a PO box cannot be used for proof of residence, and a lot of people in rural areas, specifically in Southern Humboldt County, just don't have a physical address. It's never been issued. Um, they have PO boxes, but they can't use PO boxes to qualify. So now a lot of these people cannot get local qualification. Therefore, they can't get state, state help either. So I just wanted to reiterate the differences between urban qualifications and rural qualifications and how it's pushing a lot of people out of the program. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Anyone else have any comments on agenda item number three? We are open for public comment. All right, Chair Shockley, we have no more public comment on this. Would you like to close agenda item number three? Yes, let's close agenda item number th number three. All righty. And again, thank you, Deputy Director Hillsman, for your presentation. And moving on to item number four, discussing the state law definition of equity. At the April 25th, 2023 Equity Subcommittee meeting, the subcommittee held over the discussion on the current state law definition of equity applicants and licensees. I'd like to continue that discussion today. First, in what ways, if any, should the definition of equity applicants and licensees be further refined? Uh, what gaps, if any, exist in the current definition? And uh, next, what revisions, if any, does the subcommittee recommend be considered for the portions of the equity definition established by the DCC through regulation and why? So as background, the California legislature established minimum parameters for the state's definition of equity application uh, 
through Business and Professions Code Section 26249. DCC added additional specificity to these requirements through regulations contained within Section 15014.1. DCC cannot change the legislative requirements, but can consider subcommittee recommendations related to the standards established by the regulation. Uh, members, the floor is open for discussion on this item. What exactly can we do? Like, what can we exactly recommend for this particular portion? Well, I think we can. Things that we can recommend are related to uh, the DCC's uh, business and professions code, I believe. Uh, I mean, we can make recommendations about the definition in general, but if you're asking, like, what area can we make recommendations about that the DCC uh, can impact? I, I believe that's it. Um, and Deputy Hillsman, are, are you able to comment on that and, and add some, some color to that as well? Yeah, so I think if the, the question is about eligibility for state benefits for state licensees, right? So. Um, I mentioned kind of how you might be able to qualify for fee relief. Um, and so there are a number of benefits that are connected to that definition and statute. So um, in thinking about things like arrests or convictions for cannabis related crimes or the 50% requirement for ownership or the definition for income, those are all things in statute. Right, and so certainly you can have a conversation about that today, um, but as far as advising the Department of Cannabis Control on regulatory changes, um, what I've heard as the most common area in which there um, was a desire for additional conversation was about neighborhood eligibility. So the criteria for disproportionately impacted area, um, and then also gross receipts, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, and those really relate to Income, right? So the the sixty percent area median income eligibility requirement that's also a statute, right? Um, so you I don't know if you remember like the pie chart with yeah. kind of like the things that um, yeah. are in statute and require additional legislative action, but um, that's not to suggest that you couldn't have a conversation about that today. Um, but just would note that if if you actually wanted to change it, it would require legislative action, right? Yes. Yes. Um, I look pretty closely at the uh, business and professions code and uh, personally didn't see a lot of things that I would change in it. Um, you know, but, but one thing I think, and I don't know if this is a part that could be changed or if there's agreeance in changing it, but um, part of like in relation to fee deferrals, for example, uh, the definition uh, in there, it says that certain counties qualify uh, for for eligibility and those counties are selected by uh, which counties are above the median uh, arrest rate for the state of California for for cannabis arrest right uh, and you know there's I you know I don't know if that's something that could be uh, changed uh, for that that standard of like you know is median the the right level for that or or should there be a, a higher uh, standard level to determine what counties are eligible uh, just something that that I saw in there uh, that we might want to look at. And I say that because you know there are limited resources that the state has to distribute uh, for, for these fees or any, any state benefits. Um, and we, you know, there's a desire that I've heard from applicants across the state that those resources be uh, better allocated or, or concentrated uh, where it can have a, a bigger impact on, on folks that, are, that have been disproportionately uh, impacted. Any thoughts on that from the members? I didn't see anything in that language that talked about um, police reporting districts. 
sometimes I think we, you know, kind of go after stuff with an ax as opposed to a scalpel. And we talk about zip codes and, and, uh, and um, census tracts, but what about police reporting districts? I think that gets a little bit more granular to look at communities a little bit more closely as opposed to a larger approach, a more general approach. Um, that's just my thought about that in terms of qualifying for neighborhoods and that kind of thing. Police reporting districts as, as opposed to um, like census tracts. Okay. Um, and you think census tracts would be more accurate? And, and no, I think police reporting districts in terms of arresting and arrest rates yes. in those particular census tracts. Got it. Yeah. I don't have anything. I don't have anything. Um, just want to read through the counties that are eligible. Uh, based on the median arrest rate across the state, uh, Alameda County, Alpine, Contra Costa, Del Norte, Fresno, Glen, Humboldt, Imperial, Inyo, Kern, Lake, Los Angeles, Mendocino, Merced, Riverside, Sacramento, San Bernardino, San Diego, San Francisco, San Joaquin, uh, Santa Cruz, Sierra, Solana, Stan, Stanislaus, Stanislaus uh, Tehama, Trinity, uh, Tulare, Yolo, and Yupa. Um, are there any recommendations any of the members would like to put forward in, in terms of addressing the definition? was the only one I had in terms of police reporting districts. Okay. Okay. And changing it from census tracts to police reporting districts. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I I would second that. Um can we put forward a recommendation uh to make that adjustment? Uh how how do we go about um uh, putting that into motion? Do we have to uh, write down what the actual motion is? <laughs> yes. Language, language for the motion. Yeah. Slowly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, Doctor B, would you like to? And then second it. I would like to put forth that in terms of qualifications, in terms of uh, neighborhoods, we would look at police reporting districts and arrest rates in police reporting districts for census track. And I would second that motion. So we've got recommend that the DCC look at arrest data by police reporting districts rather than by census tract. All right, so we have um, a motion on the table to recommend that the DCC look at arrest data by police reporting districts rather than by census tract. This is um, put forth by Member Brown, seconded by Before we have the vote, we're going to do public comment. <laughs> Uh, can we open it up for public comment now? Yes. Yes. We'll open up public comment on the motion on the table. Uh, Janine Coleman. I've just sent you a, a request to unmute. Actually, no, Ileana Green. Ileana Green. There you go.
Eliana Green, you are open for comment. Hi, um, my name is Eliana Green. I'm the Director of Community Engagement at the Hood Incubator, um, where we're also a member of the uh, California Cannabis Equity Alliance. Um, the Hood Incubator has also been meeting with uh, members of CEPC, as well as Origins Council, um, trying to uh, get closer to a definition. Um, so the piece of the definition I would like to talk about is what we're talking about currently, which is what areas have been disproportionately impacted. And so, um, for one, we think that, as you guys have said, a county is way too large of a landmass for us to measure disproportionately impacts. Uh, so, if something is happening in one community um, versus the entire county, that's not being measured. Um, our suggestion is for us to really look at what disproportionately impacted means in terms of looking at what enforcement activities are happening in different communities. So, we think that those will be different metrics for rural versus urban spaces. Um, but seeing where those things are disproportionately happening. So looking at a map um, and then pulling out these metrics, seeing where on the map they are happening and the places where there's high frequency of overlap of these different data points, those should be outlined at the places that are disproportionately impacted. So for example, some of the, the, the data points that would be applicable in, in rural areas would be, you know, um, what portion of folks are given beyond just who's arrested for drug uh, sentence, uh, convict, drug crimes, but what proportionality of the neighborhood is given a mandatory sentence because of that drug crime? What proportion of the of the neighborhood is convicted as a seconds. habitual offender for that drug crime? So looking at what does it look like to have high impacts of the drug war, and then mapping that on a map in the, the areas where there's overlap of these different metrics would be the, the disproportionately impacted area, and those metrics would vary for rural versus um, urban places. But nonetheless, the same methodology could be used in both. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And now we have an in-person commenter. This will be my last comment, I promise. Um, <laughs> but in regards of, of, of the safety, I'm glad that you guys are looking into that, but just want to caution that um, in places like the Central Valley, we have uh, small municipalities that don't even have a police department, the county and the sheriffs, and sometimes those numbers are not, are not present um, when we are looking for information. And then the other thing is, I understand that cities, um, sometimes when they apply for social equity funds from the state, they're required to have like an assessment. When they do these assessments of their, of their social equity program, there's no accountability. So for example, in Fresno, there were at least six recommendations that the city said that they, need to, that they, they, should, they should fix. It was mandated by the state, my understanding that they gave it before back to the state. The state saw that there's six recommendations and they, did, they have done nothing. So the city right now, Fresno has six recommendations that nobody in the city council has been able to take up because there's no pressure from the state to do so. So in regards of defining social equity, there should be better accountability and oversight on how cities are receiving funds for social equity with recommendations that they created themselves and don't apply it. They're just cheating the, the, the people. So there needs to be more insight and more overs, oversight on how cities are not doing the right thing for a community. Thank you. Thank you. Paul Hansberry, I've just sent you a request to unmute. Hi, yes, good afternoon. Thank you very much. Um, I think what we're pointing, what we need to point out again is the difference between rural versus urban. Um, that the, they're, they're entirely different animals. They're, they're different ways of, of law enforcement, you know, and un unincorporated areas with sheriffs and and cities with police departments. Um, so going by just that, uh, just the, the police reporting, rather than I think is the way the language is in the motion, um, I think would be a mistake and a, a lot more confusing. Um, with regards to the different counties that the chair uh, was, re was reading off, it's my understanding from the state that only portions of those counties and by zip code I don't know exactly how they determine the zip code. I'm sure there is some sort of a of a of a of, a, of a, an equation that that would dictate that. But you know, I don't really understand it. I know that parts of northern Mendocino County, but not southern Mendocino County, uh, again according to zip codes, but not parts of southern Humboldt, which which were dramatically impacted. And I don't understand why they're not included in in, the, in that metric. Um, so it's only portions of the counties that are eligible um, and not the entire county. So it's not a blanket statement. 
Uh, however, with uh, with um, um, I believe with Go Business criteria and the way that they're changing thirty seconds geographic uh, requirements is that they're requiring a narrative that explains how you were impacted um, rather than just a blanket a zip code or geographic area. So um, that might be another consideration. Thank you very much. Thank you. Reese, I've just sent you a request to unmute. Hi, everyone. It's Reese Benton again. Um, I spoke earlier. Um, so as far as like the equity and the war on drugs and and all of this is kind of geared around war on drugs a lot of people who was affected by the war on drugs was born in the late 70s and early 80s mid 80s so a lot of that should be part of also the process because we need to identify those people those people are really grown like me i'm almost mid 40s i mean almost to 50 years old but i was highly affected by that and everyone around around that time and around the reagan era was affected by that so that should be part of it you know because a lot of people because you said social equity and they was arrested it's a lot of people that i know are rich kids who was arrested for cannabis that qualify for social equity you know and so i think that there is has to be a point where it it has to be geared towards the people like they said even in humboldt county that was having problems and they come and they tear down their growth that should be a part of you know their legacy there to be able to qualify you know, but for us in this, in the, you know, the more city areas, urban and areas, we, it should be part of that. We were highly affected in the seventies and eighties, and it's still affecting our lives today. And I, and, you know, there are people born in the nineties and the two thousands, but they were not affected as much as we were affected. And this is what this all geared around. So that's just a little bit of, um, you know, thought when you guys are revamping the state levels. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Margro advisors, I've sent you a request to unmute. With Margaret advisors, uh, we work with rural farmers up here in the Emerald Triangle and as other commenters have mentioned, you know, there's kind of a lack of understanding of the experience of these rural victims of the war on drugs. I mean, even the mention of police data is a little frustrating because they they are not enforced by police, they're enforced by sheriff. And in fact, um, many of the victims of the war on drugs were not um, impacted by the sheriffs, but by the campaign against marijuana planting or camp raids, which were done by the um, National uh, National Guard. And um, we've actually, in the past, we've sent uh, Mr. Hillsman a map of the DEA enforcement from 2008, which shows significant portions of Southern Humboldt County being targeted um, uh, by the Drug Enforcement Agency. And so there does need to be a little bit broader understanding um, that uh, there's there are a number of different law enforcement activities that have taken place um, amongst um, you know these different areas. So where what works in terms of looking at impact in urban areas is going to be different than looking at the impact in rural areas. And so we just ask that you broaden your perspective and um, take an opportunity to look at things like DEA enforcement activity um, when considering, um, you know, uh, allowing for equitable consideration of um, all of the victims of the war on drugs. Thank you. Thank you. Janine Coleman, I've sent you a request to unmute. Good afternoon, committee members and staff. Janine Coleman, Executive Director of Origins Council. Our comments today reflect the coalition positions of Origins Council, the Hood Incubator, and the Cannabis Equity Policy Council emerging from our formal working group formed at the beginning of this year to collaborate on policy recommendations related to California cannabis <laughs> social equity issues. These comments have been previously submitted in writing. In rural areas, enforcement activities such as raised detentions and civil asset forfeiture are significant contribu contributors to impacts experienced in these regions and should be considered in criteria. Additionally, the unique challenges in capturing accurate data through census tracts in rural communities should be considered. In urban areas, enforcement activities such as stop and frisk encounters, traffic stops, and crime-free, drug-free rental housing eviction policies are significant contributors to impacts and should be considered in criteria. Data surrounding these enforcement activities in both rural and urban areas is difficult for operators to attain 
and currently plays no role in state equity criteria, which focuses on legal outcomes of enforcement, such as arrest and conviction. These rural and urban distinctions should inform an effort to more accurately map California's geographic areas most impacted by historic law enforcement activities. We recommend that the DCC resource the collection of data related to historic law enforcement activity and outcomes in urban as well as the historic rural cannabis producing regions of California. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. Thank you. Ross Gordon, I've sent you a request to unmute. Good afternoon, uh, committee members. Ross Gordon, also on behalf of Origins Council. Um, I agree with everything that Janine Coleman just said. Want to add a few other um, ideas in relation to the motion that's on the table. First, just want to agree with a couple other commenters who discuss the difficulties with police beats in rural areas. Um, our rural areas are primarily covered by sheriff's departments rather than police departments. Um, I haven't looked into it personally, but I, I don't believe there's any at least in Humboldt County, where I'm based, potentially other rural counties nearby as well, um, any data on uh, sheriff's beats that are similar to police beat delineations that I know are, are common in cities. Um, and so I feel that's important to take into account. Um, also, maybe just want to clarify uh, that our understanding is that the most recent DCC equity criteria does include those counties uh, which were mentioned. But there's a further narrowing of that criteria over the past, I think, couple of years now that it only applies to, I think, census tracts in the bottom 25% of uh, income and, and I think unemployment as well. Um, and so the result of that has been kind of this very, very fractured map, whereas one commenter mentioned previously, you have, you know, northern Mendocino County qualifying, but not southern Humboldt County. And, and the underlying issue, I think, is that it doesn't map onto people's experiences and people's experiences of law enforcement and people's experiences with the war on drugs. Um, and I think one sort of overarching consideration that I know is true with a lot of our members in rural legacy producing areas is that a lot of this, con this conversation is about affirmation and whether people's experiences with law enforcement, seconds. which were often very intense, very memorable, very traumatic, are being effectively affirmed or, or denied by state equity criteria. And, and it's very challenging because I you know, understand we're talking about bureaucratic criteria and legal definitions, um, but I hope we, we can keep in mind that the outcome of that is really hitting people on a personal level in terms of whether their experiences are recognized by, by the state of California. And so I really wanna echo the, the interest in an equity assessment to track those issues and appreciate the time today. Thank you. Alfred Torregano. I've sent you a request to unmute. Thank you so much, uh, moderator. And um, again, this is Alfred Torregano. I'm back again. You know, I uh, um, really agree with a lot of the statements that were said here. It's very clear that rural environments are separate and different in a lot of ways. Uh, as far as enforcement goes with urban environments. And even in urban environments, the stops and frisk and the and the 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 real tyranny that was taking place in the streets with police in these communities, a lot of that stuff went undocumented as well. So I although it is a statutory change, we do really think that, you know, family members of those directly impacted should also be a part uh, a, a part of this because some of the 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 war on drugs, a lot of which had taken place is irreparable. You lost the time, you lost a family member, and you don't really get that back. So this trying to help us now, we should try to get as many folks in, in, in it. The reason being beyond just the business and the morality is, is so we can keep the culture. California is the, 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 this is the, the champagne of, you know, cannabis. And, and you guys know what I mean, an analogy, right? Like, we really want to stay that and in order to do that, we need to keep the culture right. And if we match the history with data and all of these experiences, we could support and, and, and keep that alive so we can continue to be the leader across the world as we are right now. But if we don't get this right, it slips through our hands and we look really 50 foolish, seconds, you know, 50 years now. And so, like, uh, it's very clear that rural environments and urban environments need do we need like a dual definition in some sort to to really uh think about thoughtfully how both were impacted and to include them as well as keep the culture of california cannabis in a, a positive growing uh north star thank you so much thank you 
Michael Katz, I've just sent your request to unmute. Yes, good afternoon, committee. Uh, this is Michael Katz, executive director for the Mendocino Cannabis Alliance. I appreciate this conversation happening. I want to support the comments previously made by Janine Coleman and Ross Gordon uh, related to uh, the, the various comments that Origins Council has made. I also want to just point out um, one issue that relates to reporting when it comes to members of our rural community is that a lot of the enforcement actions that were taken on folks were not documented um, and there are no documents available. Uh, certain raid information is not accessible via public records request because it is confidential. Um, and so people have undergone significant experiences where they have been terrorized, um, but there is not paperwork uh, that relates directly to that. And so that is just another component of the challenge that faces us to address what we know were significant efforts of militarized enforcement throughout heritage producing regions that often did not directly result in arrest uh, or paperwork, um, but did wind up with people having assets seized, uh, people losing um, their livelihoods, people, uh, some cases, um, you know, just completely uh, devastated. So um, 30 seconds out how to incorporate that understanding into the system for accounting for the damages done disproportionately by the war on drugs is also very important as we address these other issues. Thank you. Thank you. Shirley, I've sent your request to unmute. I agree with just about everything everybody said. I just wanted to emphasize something that Alfred said and about the culture and keeping this environment to where it's, where it can exist. And there's no, I mean, we're trying to get in these urban rural, we get it, everybody was affected by it. We want everybody to, to be able to get the grants and everything. Let's have a common sense definition. We know that uh, up there in the Northern California, what was going on and we know what was going on, just like you guys know what was going on down in South Central. And so how can we have a common sense way of getting these things so that we work together and not are looking at each other pointing fingers? How can we both survive in this environment? It's kind of scary people and you don't think we, and we get it. You know what I'm saying? We know the helicopters were flying over. We know you guys were hiding your money and we get it. But to say that we don't get it and it's all this, it's not that much different. We were, both communities were targeted and affected by the war. We're trying to bring the social equity community up. How do we do that best? Working together. Thank you. Thank you. Marissa ETA, I've just sent you a request to unmute. Yes, thank you. Um, I just wanted to say that I really appreciate um, Janine Coleman and Ross Gordon's comments. I wanted to just expand a little bit on something that Ross said um, regarding neighborhood qualifications, specifically for Humboldt County and um, how the map was whittled down to census, census tracts that are only in the top 25% nationally for unemployment and poverty. Those census numbers were taken from 2017. I just want to point out that the cannabis economy has collapsed since then. And, you know, people might not have been in, in poverty as much here in Humboldt County in 2017, but they certainly are now. And I think that that should definitely be taken into account. And maybe these cens census jurisdictions should be updated with um, real time information instead of, you know, the very first year of legalization when everybody was just getting into the business. Now, now everybody's collapsed and people are really struggling to make ends meet and that should really be taken into account. Thank you. Thank you. Hannah Nelson, I've just sent your request to unmute. Nelson, I'm a longtime cannabis attorney 
who has had the experience in both urban and rural areas of being a direct witness to the terror that the war on drugs has inflicted upon many, many, many citizens of all stripes and all locations. The problem, as Ileana Green indicated, and Janine and Ross and Michael Katz indicated, that is, is really a matter of data and what is the appropriate data. I am strongly in favor of an assessment, and I really think that we need to figure out a way to include the stop and frisks and the raids that did not result in a conviction or an arrest, but still had tremendous impact on uh, the individuals and communities' lives. Uh, I think that an assessment is the way to go. And one of the many data points that has not been mentioned is to look at the funding that was provided to law enforcement of all stripes, whether it was police departments or camp raids or local sheriff's departments or any even district attorney's offices for uh, the war on drugs and pursuing the war on drugs. There are better records for funding than there are for many of the raids and stop and frisk. So that is a point. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. And Cassandra Taliaferro, I've just sent you a request to unmute. Cassandra Taliaferro. There you go. <laughs> My name is Cassandra Taliaferro with Skyline Farms. I um, just wanted to speak to Humboldt County being removed from the qualifying neighborhood. I was personally escorted by gunpoint by the DEA at age 12 while they were raiding a neighboring parcel. There was no arrest record. My father was a missing person for five years. He was in the cannabis industry before his remains were recovered and it's still an unsolved homicide. There's no arrest record for that. I was detained, pulled over, searched numerous times over non-existent traffic violations, no arrest records. I am a survivor of the drug war. We suffered severe targeted military style enforcement over decades directly related to the prohibition of cannabis by camp and Operation Green Sweep. Uh, I was really disappointed to hear the change in the 50, 1% equity qualifier. Nobody's in a 49%, 51% relationship. This affects married couples owning small farms. Um, and I uh, had to dig up some birth certificates of estranged siblings only to find out that the uh, money ran out for the equity fee waiver. So if you could like consider all the licenses that are expiring later in the year that they'll never be able to get the funding if the funding is running out 30 seconds um and birth certificates should be listed as a required document in the um in the required documents list for the equity fee waivers um but uh, yeah thank you for the opportunity to speak thank you all right, we are still taking public comment on agenda item number four. Chair Shockley, there is no other commenters waiting. So can we close agenda item number four? Sure, let's close uh, agenda item number four for public comment. Okay. So uh, I guess that leaves it to the committee to take a vote on the recommendation. Okay. Um, do I call it or the moderator? Yeah, call it. the moderator. Just a moment. So the recommendation on the table is that the DC's look, DCC look at arrest data by police reporting districts rather than by census tract. So let's begin the voting. Say aye if you agree or nay if you don't. Dr. Imani Brown. Aye. Sarah Payne Pearson. It's not here. Christine De La Rosa. Aye. And Chair Shockley. Aye. 
the recommendation passes. All right, thank you. All right, uh, members, we've had a good discussion and we heard input from the public. Uh, we've, ta we've taken the motion, we voted the motion forward. Let's see, let's move on to item number five. Item number five is future agenda items. At our first subcommittee, subcommittee meeting, we established a list of priorities for a subcommittee discussion. Those priorities are a statewide definition of equity, the collection of equity data, provisional licenses for equity applicants, and also resources for equity businesses, including access to education and funding. Uh, of course, I'm always open to additional suggestions from committee members on what they would like to discuss on a future agenda. Uh, members, the floor is open for discussion on future agenda items. I don't have any future agenda items, but I would like to prioritize the data collection at our next meeting. Um, did we uh, send recommendations to the DCC? Or are we still trying to gather the recommendations of what type of, I know we had a whole discussion about the type of data we wanted. Yeah. But to me, that is like, in order to do what we're doing today and ask for changes in regulation, it's super important to have the data to support that. Absolutely. Um, and so I feel like that should be a, one of our top agendas for the next meeting. Okay. I uh, concur. I concur. Specifically coming up with recommendations yeah. that we put forward for. Yeah. The for data, data specific, yeah. what types of data yeah. that yeah. we want to see. So we did we did put forward recommendations around data. I think maybe two meetings ago. Yes, I, and I wanted to revisit and see where sure. we've gotten with it. Like okay. you know, the way that Eugene came to us and was like, "Here's a presentation about the thing you wanted to know about." Something similar for the next meeting, so that we can see like what one of the questions I think we had was, "What are we allowed to take? What kind of data are we allowed to collect?" And there was supposed to be some follow up around that. Um, so that's what I would like to see. Okay. But I feel like that's a really important piece to what we've been discussing in agenda item three and four. Sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that recommendation. <laughs> Any other items we want to discuss in the future? I know I'd like to discuss uh, social equity subsidies and benefits, loan programs, grant programs, educational resources for social equity in the future. Uh, that's on our list of priorities and something that we haven't gotten to yet and um, planning to put it on next meeting's agenda. Like that. Yep. I agree. Okay, let's open it up to hear from the public, uh, public comment on what future agenda items ought to be for our committee. Yes, we can open up for agenda item number five, which is listed on the screen, uh, future agenda items. So if you'd like to make a comment, please raise your hand by clicking on the hand icon next to your name if you've logged onto the meeting or by pressing star three if you've called into the meeting. For our in-person commenters, please raise your hand and our audience moderator will work with you. And if you would like to state your name when you uh, make your comment, please do so, but don't feel obligated. All commenters will have two minutes to speak with a 30 second warning and each member of the public will have one opportunity to speak on each agenda item. So with no further ado, Ileana Green, I've just sent you a, a, a request. Hey, this is Ileana Green again from the Hood Incubator. I would love for us to follow this conversation of uh, defining a social equity definition by really digging into uh, what the disproportionately impacted area should look like, meaning what metrics from both, both urban and rural spaces um, should be looked at in terms of uh, viewing where those activities occurred. So I would love for folks from both rural and urban spaces to be able to come to share, you know, the different data points that relate to uh, uh, law enforcement activity in their community. Thank you. Nina Parks, I've just sent you a request to unmute. Hello. I would also um, like to continue the conversation of the definitions and, the, and taking a look at um, what qualifiers really uh, like a human being actually experiences that would make them dis disproportionately impacted. Also, it would be wonderful if we could get presentations from every jurisdiction that has 
equity programs and get them to present out on um, whatever data that they have, um, as well as having GoBiz come in and uh, um, just really lay out what, um, you know, what information that they have on handing out you know, uh, the grants and then also like, how is that actually like what kind of feedback they're getting from each one of the jurisdictions as well as the constituents. So, um, really involving the, the different local jurisdictions and go biz in the, in those conversations that you had mentioned would be wonderful for all of us to hear as well. Thank you. Margo advisors. I've just sent your request to unmute. Um, thank you. Committee members Kelly Flores again with Margaret advisors. Um, we'd like to see the committee um, spend a little bit of time ensuring a more equitable application process um, in terms of criteria for between rural and urban applicants. Um, we feel that the state's refusal to allow the U of PO boxes, the use of PO boxes um, for proof of residency demonstrates a really inherent bias against rural applicants. Um, you know, rural homestead farms, they don't receive US Postal Service. They only have access through their local post office. Um, and so we believe, you know, rectifying that allows um, equitable access, as well as allowing the use of any official document, um, property tax bills, voter registrations, vehicle titles, um, you know, giving people the ability, the flexibility to um, participate in the process. You know, we're very concerned that this is not being applied equitably, and um, <laughs> it's, it's a little bit ironic seeing that. Um, so we would like to see the committee um, ensure that the DCC makes a better effort at that. And I also want to point out that, you know, there was some discussion of the rulemaking process. But in fact, if you look at the State Cannabis Equity Act, Section 26244E actually allows um, review, adopt, amend, and repeal guidelines that are exempted from the rulemaking provisions of the Administrative Procedures Act. So they have a lot of power seconds. of business and economic development to actually make these changes without having going to go through an administrative process. Um, so this is something that I think needs to be looked at in a little more detail um, and provide better support um, for, for both rural and urban communities. Thank you. Thank you. Cheney Turner. Cheney Turner, I've sent you. Cheney Turner, you dropped off. If you'd like to make a comment, please raise your hand. There you go. Hold on. I've just sent your request to unmute. Uh, beyond equity and uh, chair of Oakland Cannabis Commission, just wanted to uh, uplift the comments of my affiliates uh, from hood incubator and social equity workers about the continuation of the discussion of the social equity definition. It's definitely important, especially now, um, being that we're at a time where affirmative action and race based language has um, uh, uh, been deemed unconstitutional to really um, continue this um, language. This uh, conversation, um, I just want to point out that data is very important um, looking at other jurisdictions, such as city of Oakland, um, our race and equity department. We have also had some recent um, polls with. Um, social equity operators that can be uh, useful for the conversation. So if there's any other cities that have something similar um, input, that could be helpful. Um, also looking at, you know, our uh, uh, neighborhoods that have been impacted um, by police terrorism, um, uh, different, different beats, and um, also looking at um, our uh, educational system in schools, especially uh, prior to uh, 1996. Um, so just wanted to add uh, those points. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Marissa, I've just sent you a request to unmute. Um, yes, I'd really like to continue the discussion on um, how the equity program can be changed so that people whose licenses expire later in the year, like between now and the end of the year, aren't um, aren't being told no, that they can't get any funds because the funds have, have run out. Um, people who whose licenses they expire later in the year, they don't have any choice as to when their licenses expire. And so it, it, it feels like it's discrimination because, you know, there's nothing they can do to 
qualify for an equity grant if there's no money left by the time that they're allowed to apply. So I would like to open up a topic of discussion on what changes can be made to the program so that it can be distributed more evenly throughout the year for all the license expiration dates. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members of the public, last call for agenda item number five, which is future agenda items. Oh, we have one in person. <laughs> um, I just want to, if, if next meeting we can discuss further, what are the um, oversight for the municipalities that receive social equity funds that have recommendations and don't adopt the re recommendations for their cities? Like, what's the accountability with cities that, so, do y'all get what I'm saying? No, I, I'm under, what do you mean by accommodations? I'm like, no, no, I, I'm apologize. Let me reword it like this. What are the accountability measures that the committees have when cities that I get that receive social equity funds and don't apply them accordingly to the state's guidelines. There are, oh, there are no guidelines, there's no accountability. I mean, they're not as strong enough guidelines for municipalities to follow because social equity programs are pretty much just whatever the city decides to do. Um, like I said, very specifically to the situation in Fresno where they have recommendations and they, have, they haven't adopted not one. And so where's the accountability with that? He's coming from that word accommodations. I don't Thank know. you. I don't think it's been when he says that. Surely, yeah. I've just sent you a request to unmute. Thank you. Um, just wanted to agree basically with everybody that was saying, uh, let's get together again and try to get a definition that helps both the rural and the agrarian communities, because this is about survival up in uh, the legacy farmers. And just like they said, the licenses, our time is ticking. And can't we get them support to make sure that that doesn't happen and they get the, the funding that they need? Because this is about the whole equity program and its survival. And believe me, California doesn't care where they get the revenue from. They will take it from RJ Reynolds and take it from Marlboro and take it from Glass. They, they don't care where the revenue comes from. This is about survival of the social equity program in California. And so we need to talk to get, a, a, it, it makes common sense to say PO boxes have to qualify. I mean, that's common sense. And so how can we make this program, it's, it's, it's almost about the bottom of the barrel, the last, you know, instead of uplifting everybody in the system and making sure everybody has the tools that they need to make this program 30 seconds successful. thank you thank you cassandra taliaferro i've just sent you a request to unmute hi i had just learned that our local equity verification office is only funded to administer the grants and not continue the verification program so there is currently no way of just becoming locally verified in Humboldt County. Um, and unless you applied for the first round of grants, which are now, it's closed, there is no way of becoming locally qualified. So I understand that there's that other funding pool that's still available if you're locally qualified, but if you have no way of becoming locally qualified, then that is also not available to you. I don't know the solution to that other than perhaps um, some funds be allocated towards local qualifications beyond just grant administration. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, there are no other commenters for agenda item number five. Do we want to conclude the meeting? Yes, yes. And uh, before we conclude the meeting, I just want to point out 
that we are now holding these meetings in person. Uh, I know we've been holding them all year through Zoom or, or electronic platform, but virtually. And I want to thank the members who have traveled here, uh, respectively, um, to, to be here in person and take the time to do that and invite uh, members of the public who are able to uh, to come in person in the future, uh, just letting folks know that that is now an option again. Uh, and with that said, members uh, and members of the public, thank you for your time and the meeting is adjourned.